I'm really excited about this talk. Uh, I met John last year at a conference uh, at a workshop on building bots, and uh, I thought it was really fascinating and, and fun. So hopefully some of that, you'll get some of that tonight. Uh, John was at that time working at WMYC uh, with the data news team, but he's since then moved over to Quartz and works with their bot studio. So uh, let's give a great round of applause to welcome John. Hello. Thanks for having me. This is fun. OK. Hi. I'm John. I work at Quartz. And Quartz is at QZ.com. Uh, we are a site that is news and information about the global economy for people who are sort of on the edge of uh, the leading edge of knowledge um, and are interested in lots of different aspects of, of the global economy and our life. Um, and I'm at jk at qz.com. Uh, and I'll have another email for you at the end if you're interested in more bot stuff. Um, so the Quartz Bot Studio uh, just got underway. It's really an experimental uh, operation within Quartz uh, that's sort of a collective of people uh, who have other jobs and also a few of us who are, uh, who are devoted to the Bot Studio. And there are f sort of four areas that we're sort of focusing on right now. Um, so the, the main thrust of all of this for us is about conversational interfaces. So this is software that you can talk with or talk to. Um, and that could involve text talking, like chatting and, and text messaging. Some, so basically bots you can type with, right? Um, there's also uh, emerging voice interfaces, right? Like Alexa and Google Home. So we, we all know about Siri. These are uh, bots you can actually talk with, so we're interested in that as well. Um, we're also interested in the AI that is helping to fuel this bot boom um, using artificial intelligence, natural language processing to make this all happen. And artificial intelligence is a big topic. Um, I'm in the world of journalism. I'm trying to sort of figure out how AI will help with reporters and editors and users of uh, sites like ours and other publications as well. Uh, lastly, um, we are building tools specifically for journalists in Slack. How many of you all use Slack? All right, so this is very similar to the world of journalism. Basically, everybody's using Slack. So what we are doing is we're actually going to, we're spending this next year or so um, building tools for journalists and anybody, really, um, for Slack. And we're starting by building them for our own reporters and editors. But the cool part about all this, the entire thing, is that because it's under a grant from the Knight Foundation and because Quartz operates under sort of a spirit of generosity in general, which is kind of amazing. I'm brand new there. I'm very, very impressed with this. We're going to be sharing all this information. So we're posting this stuff on GitHub. We're blogging about it uh, at blog.qz.com. And we're going to be sharing all of this, including those tools I mentioned for journalists or for anybody. So as we learn along the way, we're um, sharing, them out, sharing all of this out as well. So it's early days for us in some ways. In other ways, Quartz has been playing with bots internally and externally for a little while. So let's just talk a little bit about uh, what I'm talking about and, and get do some hands-on demos. This is all, everything up here is going to be used at some point in this conversation. So, um, so let's talk about software you can type with. OK. Does anybody have a cell phone? Anybody? Yeah? Okay. So get your cell phones out and uh, text the word hi to this phone number. It's my server. I will not use your phone number. I promise. It's not going anywhere nefarious. But give it a shot. And th this will start our little discussion about text-based conversations. Can you see that? 646-887-6253. And just text hi to that. It should work. Did, did, is it talking back to you? OK, good. I see nods. That's a good sign. You're talking to a very, very simple bot. It's running on my uh, server in the cloud. It is not very talented. 
It only asks a couple of questions, and it only accepts particular answers. It's easy to stump it. And knowing y'all are UX experts, I suspect you will try, and it will fail. Um, but anyway, so for those of you who didn't take out your cell phone, do not want to give me your phone number, I understand. Uh, basically what it did is it asked a series of questions and then responded accordingly. So it asked about pets, whether you like cats, whether you like dogs, and depending on how you answered the questions, you got something different back, right? So uh, somebody offer up what they got. What'd you, what'd you get at the end? Anybody? No? Oh, really? Is it, are you waiting for it to come back? <gasps> it just asked, oh. Oh, it's asking about dogs and cats. Is it slow, though? Ah, oh, all right, I gotta get on that. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I, I, I can't really blame the cell phone connection because we're probably across from like 80 towers right here. So, okay, <laughs> basically what, I will tell you what, so you don't have to keep waiting. Um, it asks you whether you like dogs, whether you like cats, and depending on how you answer those two questions, it gives you something different back. And I'll apparently have to put it on a more sophisticated server uh, so, it doesn't, so you, it doesn't get so slow. Um, that is an example of simple SMS text bots. And what's kind of cool about it is when it's working, um, it will actually, it's one piece of code that's handling everybody's texts at the same time and keeping track of who's texting and, and, and keeping track of which answers you, you provided and then answering back. And it all happens, supposedly, it usually happens pretty quickly. Um, and, and this, this sort of principle is some, and I also threw in a couple of emoji and tried to make it a little playful. That's actually part of the uh, UX, and you're, I'm gonna come back to this a lot. I, the, the personality of the interaction is super important. So this exact principle that you just sort of halfway experienced uh, was behind something that we did when I was working at WNYC, um, and uh, the podcast Note to Self, ran a week-long project called InfoMagical. And InfoMagical was about trying to deal with your information overload, right? So there's so much coming at us. How can we be more productive? How can we try to tamp some of this stuff down? And it was a week-long project on the radio and on a podcast. Um, and there's a challenge with that. So you may listen to the radio every day. You may, if you listen to the radio at all, you may hit or miss on that. It's, if you're trying to get people to participate in a five-day project, it's kind of hard to make sure you get back to them, right? We can send you email, but you get a lot of email. Uh, we can remind you on the radio, but you might not be listening. So what we ask people to do is in order to participate in the project, give us your phone number. And lots of people did. We had over 20,000 people participate in this. Um, and so what happened was, kind of like what you were just experiencing, you would uh, get text messages to help remind you about what that day's uh, task was, because we had people g do little projects, and to stay connected with the project for five days. So this text says, it, this is actually two text messages, one's an image, and one's te the text. This is just SMS text. And it says, remember, your Inframagical Week goal is be more in tune with myself. Write it out, stick it up, Put it anywhere and everywhere you consume information and text goal to change it. You could have one of a few different goals. Okay, that was the first text you got. On the first day, you got this message and it says, Happy Infomagical Day 1, your first challenge, single tasking. So that's doing just one thing at a time. Listen here for directions, and there's a link, and good luck. All right, so the first day, the Monday morning, this is what you got. Halfway through the day, you got another text. It said, hello, just checking in. Are you managing to do just one thing at a time today? Reply with yes or no. So here I reply, yes. And it says, great, here's a puppy. Um, and it says, nice, take a second to look at this puppy and do nothing else, right? Single tasking day. Uh, and if you answered no, you got a different puppy and some words of encouragement. Again, changing the response based on what you said. It's a simple, Simple uh, uh, conceit, but it really worked nicely. Oh, so um, what we did with this is that we were able to keep people participating all week. 
we actually ask them to record messages. You can, we can actually set this up so if you respond call, it would call you back and you could record a message at the tone and that way, since it's a radio program, we got people to participate that way as well. Um, but we got hundreds of voicemail messages that way. Um, we even could ask people an unscientific survey about how well they were um, accomplishing their goal and it was very much of an interaction. And what's interesting about this is that the people who are participating knew that everybody was getting these texts, right? It wasn't a surprise, it, but it feels very much like an intimate experience. It's like a one-on-one -on -one experience. We're using a medium that you use to talk to your friends, your family, and very specifically, it was written in the voice of the host, host Manoush Zamarodi. And because we worked, and the writers on the show worked really hard to craft these, te these texts to be in her voice, the whole experience felt like it was coming from her. We didn't pretend like, hey, this is Manoush, but we really kept the spirit of her voice and her attitude in the texts. And we are in this sort of, it felt like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, even though it was a one-to-many conversation, which is not dissimilar from radio or podcasting. If you sit there and listen to your best, your favorite, most favorite podcast or your most favorite radio station, if you're listening to This American Life or Radio Lab or anything like that, it really feels like people are talking to you, right? You know that they're not, but it feels that way. And it's a nice, intimate conversation. Public radio is built on this model, basically. That's why people then contribute for free, you know, something they get for free. They spend money, contribute, in the, because it's so intimate. And this is playing that same kind of a role. Okay, so now at Quartz, we have an app. This is the Quartz app. And this is all the app is. There, it is a chat interface. And I'll, we'll, we'll play more of it here in a second. But there are no, there's not a list of headlines. There's not a whole bunch of videos. It's basically not what a news app should be. <laughs> it's completely different. It's a chat interface. So this is the opening screen. If you, it says, hi there, thanks for trying the new app. It's a conversation about the news, sort of like texting. We send messages and you can respond below by tapping buttons as they appear. It says like this. So you click that and it's like, yep, like that, nice. Open the app whenever you want and we'll give you the most important and interesting news from around the global economy. Okay, so this is the extent of the app. Um, if you, uh, this is from actually last week. Uh, a lot of earnings reports have, have been coming out in the last week or so. So this is how the app handled the earnings reports. I'll just read it for you. From oil to gadgets and pharma to food, a huge range of companies reported quarterly earnings today. Wading through these reports can be dull, so in service to you, here's a whizzy summary of 20 earnings releases you can digest in under a minute, or in a minute. Here's a lightning round, and it says, the key to reading the results are emoji, right? Made of money, doing fine, meh, been better, and exclamations. Um, so, here it goes. So this is a screen capture of it. First up, gadgets. And so this is exactly how, so Nokia, some challenges remain. LG Electronics, premium washing machines, Samsung, explosive profit growth, right? The explosive phone, right? Okay, now for banks, Deutsche Bank. So, and these are all with emoji. So this has got a lot of personality and spirit to it. This is not a bot. This is written by people. There's a team at Quartz who writes just for the app and for the morning newsletters too but they are crafting this experience every day, all day, um, and using here we have a little intermission, little, little animated GIFs, and, and more emoji, airplanes. So this is the experience, and it has a lot of personality. And I'm convinced that this is why our app remains popular, because it is really, really well written. The experience, the user experience, as you guys might think about it, is this kind of cool chat-like interface, you know, where it's coming in, and it comes, and there are buttons to click, right? But I will say that I think that the user experience here also has to do a lot with the personality and things like picking the animated GIFs to go along with it. So that's what you get at the end. A little rocky. 
Nice. All right. Um, interestingly, you'll notice that for a chat-like interface, it doesn't have a whole lot of chat ability, right? Um, you saw it just had two buttons at the bottom, right? So this is another mock-up of something that we're experimenting with in Facebook, right? So here we have the same two buttons and we have sort of a similar feed of information, but then there's a white box at the bottom. What would go in that white box? What would people say? If people could speak back to us, what would they say? We're curious and we're gonna find out and we're gonna share our results. Um, there are other people who are obviously doing this. Facebook has a lot of um, bots out there. Uh, not so many news and information journalism bots, but there are, there are a few out there. Uh, they just had a big conference, the F8, where they announced more features that uh, bots can do. Um, anybody play with Poncho? Do you know what Poncho is? Yeah, seeing some nods. Um, Poncho started out as a weather texting service. Started here in New York. It's based near here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and has, what happened was, so just like the texting that you were getting, it would, the, the texts would come to you from Poncho, today is gonna be rainy, don't forget your umbrella, and it would have some spirit to it though. It's a, it's a little cat, so it would sort of have the personality of that cat. Well, people started texting back to Poncho, and the folks who made it were like, hmm, this is pretty interesting, what can we do with this? So they've, so, they've wired up, um, some artificial intelligence and some natural language program, natural language processing, to try to handle uh, that incoming information in, in an automatic way. Um, and so here's an example. And for those of you on the side and stuff, I'll, I'll read it. So Pancho says, how are you feeling, BB? You hungry? And BB, apparently, this is this little emoji, says, I'm starving. Pancho says, like a mother loves her children, I love all food equally, but this week I'm really feeling gua guacamole. I've got a great recipe, wanna hear it? And the person says, I want that recipe. Cool, let me guac you through this. Get ready to screen grab, baby. Step one, throw avocado, garlic, onion, salt, lime, and cilantro into a big bowl. And it goes on with a, a quick little recipe. Full of personality. A um, couple of things to note. One, it's definitely got a feel to it, right? Maybe I embellish it a little bit with my rendition. But, um, but also, if you see the answers to the question here are not just Y or N, right? So the person interacting with Pancho, Pancho says, how are you feeling, BB? You hungry? And BB responds, I'm starving. Doesn't say yes, no, maybe. It says, I'm starving. And the, the bot interprets that correctly as being, oh, continue on, this, on, the, on, the, recipe, uh, on the food theme. Um, do you wanna hear it? I got a great recipe, I wanna hear it? I want that recipe. It's not an answer to the question, yes or no, it is, but it wasn't a straight yes or no, or yeah, no, without, forget it, whatever you'd say. Um, and, and Pancho responds accordingly. So that takes some artificial intelligence and some write, uh, obviously some good writing as well. Again, um, I'm not even showing you, these are just text grabs that I've put on here. I'm not even showing you the interface, which is Facebook Messenger or several other platforms but you still get the user interaction, right? The user experience is a, is a, is a written personality-based experience. Okay. So that, that was me reading things, right? So now we have bots that actually can talk with you, right? How many of you have Alexa or Google Home? Ooh, not very many, interesting. Okay, we should have a conversation about this. So I'm interested to find out why or why not. So I have Alexa right here. Alexa, hello. Hello. Okay, that's good. That's important that she responds because otherwise this would be a sort of a bad demo. Okay. Um, so with Alexa, you can do lots of things. If you say her name, she wakes up. Okay. Um, Alexa, open cat facts. Here's your cat fact. A tortoise shell is black with red or orange markings and a calico is white with patches of red, orange, and black. Okay, there you go. That's a cat fact. 
I hear cat facts every day. I have a daughter who loves cats. That's what I get. So you also get the weather, you also get the time. There's lots of things you can get from our friend here. Um, but sometimes I feel like you might need a little more personality out of our, our robot. So how about this? Alexa, play Quartz Demonstration. Hi, John. How are you today? Good. Oh, great. Would you like to hear about today's news? Sure. Are you sure about that? Because it's pretty depressing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, forget it. Okay. Talk to you later. And goodbye all of you other humans in the room, too. So if, you're, if your news has a little bit more personality to it, you know, are you more likely or less likely to come back and uh, get your news from a, an interface you can talk to? Um, are you going to use an interface you could talk to at all? What does it mean to use this device this way? I think it's something that you, especially as user experience interested folks, should think about because there's a lot going on in this space. Um, and it's, it's, it's very interesting. One of the issues that comes up all over and over again is this discoverability. Like how would you know what to say to get what you need, right? You could ask. The robot, um, there are some other ways you can look at an app. It's not entirely clear what the best way to do that is. So that's still an issue. The other issue is that a lot of people just feel, how many of you feel like this is just not, this is not where things are going? Like, do, do, does anybody feel that way? Sometimes, okay, you get a few people. So when I get a lot of those questions, like, really, are we ever gonna really talk to our devices? And the only thing I will say is, if you have kids or you know kids, watch them use Alexa because they get it. Like there is no friction. When we talk about like friction on how to learn stuff and how we as adults like try to navigate our phones or whatever, kids do not have any problem talking to this device and they figure it out much faster and are much more tolerant of some of the errors and actually discover things faster. So I know because I have a focus group of two at home and I just am in awe and it's kind of makes, it keeps me uh, thinking about how and when things work and don't work with Alexa and um, her counterparts uh, like Google Home. Um, so we're experimenting with how to do news and information in Alexa. And I'm always thinking she's going to talk back at me. Um, and we're going to, again, share out what we learn. There's a lot of stuff coming these days. Um, I think they just announced um, a new t uh, TV or Kindle Fire or something that has this built in. You can actually get that same service on your iPhone if you have the app. Um, so there, it's, it's out there, it's something to experiment with. Especially, I'm be especially interested to see if y'all sort of explore it. Um, okay, so um, these are movies that do what I just did, just in case it didn't work. Okay, so we'll skip over them. <laughs> um, so the thing that is sort of behind these bots these days is artificial intelligence, specifically natural language processing. So artificial intelligence and machine learning, especially machine learning and deep learning, are all um, computer systems um, that have been around, the, the principles have been around for a long time, but they're just kind of coming to the fore in a way that we can play with them and have them in uh, little devices or connected to the internet. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about, so that computers can do thinking to me is super cool, but not exactly what's going to change me or my industry. So I'm thinking about uh, news and information acquisition and how artificial intelligence will play a role. So there's three sort of main, well, there are many, many areas where artificial intelligence is useful. One is natural language processing, which you just experienced, which was, if I say something, can the machine understand what I mean? Here's an example. Alexa, do I need an umbrella tomorrow? 
No rain is expected in New York tomorrow. Okay, so I didn't say anything about rain. I didn't say about anything about weather. I didn't say anything about New York. I didn't say I didn't say what the date was. I said, do I need a, an umbrella? So, do I need an umbrella tomorrow? Gets interpreted to mean check the forecast for tomorrow in New York because that's where we are, and respond accordingly. So that whole process from understanding what I said to then using that information to go get the answer that's uh, powered by artificial intelligence and natural language processing. Okay, the other couple of things that um, AI is really good at, one is sorting things out. So spam filters, basically, right? Spam is, uh, if, if spam is always changing, but the way spam filters work is that at, on these servers you have um, um, feeds that are like, this is machine, this is spam, machine, this is not spam. And then here's a new email, spam or not spam? And the computer says, spam or not spam. Not based on anything you've written per se, but how it recognizes it and how it fits and matches in one of these two categories. So this categorization is sort of important. Um, so um, Andrew McGill at the uh, Atlantic, which is a sister publication of, the, of Quartz, made this bot, which kind of does the same thing. So Donald Trump, he tweets. Uh, you may have heard that. Um, and before, when he, before he was uh, even campaigning, he tweeted from, I believe, a Samsung phone. I think that's what it was. And so, uh, and you know when you tweet, if you ever see people's tweets, you can see, like, sent from Twitter from my phone or sent from these different things, right? So we have this whole corpus of tweets from Donald Trump from when he had his Samsung phone. All right. Then during the campaign, there started to be some tweets from an iPhone, and it was pretty well understood that that was not Donald Trump tweeting, that was somebody from the campaign tweeting, right? So we have basically tweets that we're pretty sure are Donald Trump, and tweets we're pretty sure was a, were a campaign staffer. The thing is now, he's in the White House, and all of the tweets are coming from an iPhone, even his. So what um, Andrew McGill did is he set up basically the same kind of thing. He taught the machine, here are all Donald Trump tweets, and here are all the staffer tweets. Given any new tweet, which pile does it go into? So that's kind of a cool way for journalism, like if you think about it, right, so much is going on in our government that's based on Donald Trump's tweets to know whether they are from him or from a staffer is actually pretty good information. So there's a whole site now called Trump or Not Bot. Uh, it's a Twitter account. It's not a site, but it's a Twitter account. And so here's what it does. These are from just a couple of days ago. Uh, so here's the, tr here's the tweet. Mainstream, parentheses, fake media refuses to state our long list of achievements, including 28 legislative signings, strong borders, and great optimism, exclamation point. The bot has determined that this is a 95% chance it was written by Trump himself, based on a whole bunch of things. The next one says, looking forward to rally in the great state of Pennsylvania tonight at 7.30. Big crowd, big energy. That one, it, the bot thinks it's a 36% chance that he wrote it himself. And the bottom one is even less of a chance, 27% chance. Um, very interesting. There's, uh, it, if you read the article, it also finds that um, there are certain characteristics of a Trump tweet that sort of set it apart from the staff tweets, including extra spaces and things like this. It's very interesting. So the ability to do this kind of thing as a journalist or as somebody who's not a particularly you know, accomplished software developer working? Yeah. Is something that I equate to Google Maps. So as recently as like seven or eight years ago, if you wanted to put a map into a newspaper or onto a website, you had to have a $10,000 program, the skills to use that program, 
um, and the data of the place that you wanted to map. So if you wanted to map Sydney, Australia, you'd have to go out and get the data for Sydney, Australia, right? So now, with literally a line of code in a browser, you can get a map of anywhere in the world, right? I mean, this, it's, it's ridiculous that I even have to explain this to you. You know this, you do this all the time. But it's kind of amazing. You have the world, uh, the world in data form, down to very close zoom levels, um, accessible to you. Even though you don't have all that on your data on your computer, you don't know how to use a mapping program, maybe. Maybe you do. Um, but you don't need to, right? So to me, that sort of revolution is kind of what's happening in AI right now. Because there are all sorts of um, services now, including several at Google, where you can just send information to Google or to one of these services and get back the answer without having to have the entire thing on your computer. Or maybe not even a whole lot of skill on how to use artificial intelligence. I certainly don't. So here's, a, here's an example. This is a picture from like not far from here, near the court's offices. And what I can do is I can very easily drag and drop this thing to the Google Vision API. And here's what I get back. Anybody ever done this? You get back car, vehicle, road, lane, city, urban area, street, downtown, infrastructure. That's crazy. Right? It just recognized what was in that picture. But the craziest part about that, I mean, part of it is like, okay, okay, enough computer power, you can do anything. But the craziest thing about it is that I don't have to have that computer power. I did this on my own computer because I dragged the picture to Google. Same here. Take this face, and you get joy, possible. Right? Sorrow, very unlikely. Also unlikely, anger, surprise, exposed, blurred, or headwear. Although it's kind of weird, she does have something on her head, so you know, AI is not perfect. Um, but that is, that's kind of amazing to me that not only can this be done, but that you can do it right off your computer. And what's really interesting is that if, if you use their API, the data comes back like this, which is structured data in a form that if you have a little bit of coding chops, you can use and, um, and make new projects out of. So that's what I did. Uh, let's see what we got here. Oh, now is the moment where I should use the headset. Okay, hold on, I'm gonna set this down. Okay, I have here very sophisticated pizza. Okay, I have here a raspberry pie. Different kind of pie, haha. <laughs> um, okay, so what I'm gonna do uh, so the Raspberry Pi, for those of you who don't know, is a $35 computer that is running on, it's got a couple of gigabytes on this little card there. It's a Linux computer. It's super little. It's not super, I mean, it's pretty sophisticated. It's got a, com it's a computer, obviously. Um, but it certainly doesn't have the world's knowledge of photographs on here, right? But it does have a camera, and I wired it up with a little button. Okay, so now I'm going to take a picture of my pizza. Hang on. Okay, so let's take a picture. A little red light goes on, it flashes. Okay. So the red light went on and it flashed. So now it's sending it to Google and the light went out, so it's all sent up to Google. So what could I do with that? Well, let's try this. Alexa, load latest photograph. The words I would use to describe what I see are green, food, leaf, shape, and produce. Huh, okay. Didn't recognize it as pizza, but did see the, uh, it's got kind of a wide angle lens. Did see the green, it looks like it, maybe it thought it was grass. Okay, let's see, what should we take a picture of? What else? Let's try, try this again. Uh, anybody have like a water bottle handy? Oh, you, you do, yeah. Let's, let's take a picture, hold that, and let's just see, oops, get the cord out of the way. Let's see if it, what it does if I take a picture of the water bottle and y'all sitting here. Okay. I was hoping pizza would figure out. It's distracted by the green, green floor. Okay. Alexa, load latest photograph. The words I would use to 
words I would use to describe what I see are phenomenon, lunar eclipse, event, aurora, lens flare, and celestial event. <laughs> Excellent. You guys are very impressive. All right. I don't know, I don't know what we saw. Actually, this, this particular uh, pie has a... Um, let's try one more. Okay, this time I'm going to do this trick which I have never done before, although I saw it was possible. I'm, you can plug an HDMI lens, uh, HDMI uh, uh, cable into the Raspberry Pi. Let's see if it shows up here. Oops. Is it not showing up? No? Hang on. No? No, we're not going to get it. I was going to say it would be fun to see what I was actually taking a picture of, right? Okay, let's try one more. You ready for one more? Should we do one more? Okay. I kind of want it. I want this pizza to work. Okay, hang on. <laughs> let's see if we can. Let's, let's try the pizza. Yeah, I'm wondering. Here, yeah, let's. Unabashedly a pizza. All right. And there goes the light. Let's try it one more time. Alexa, load latest photograph. The words I would use to describe what I see are food, dish, cuisine, meal, breakfast, baked goods, and dessert. <laughs> Excellent. So the last thing I'm just going to share with you is that, again, Quartz is... is um, working under this grant from the Knight Foundation where we're making tools. Um, we're playing, I was playing today with a little simple Twitter monitor. There's some expensive uh, so software and other services you can use to get certain Twitter alerts. We're trying to make really simple, cheap ones. That I was playing with that today. Um, and um, I also made another one for one of our reporters who, ha who maintains this page. Um, so every time there's an airline glitch, like a computer glitch or something that uh, sidelines a whole bunch of flights, um, people start complaining about it on Twitter. Um, and if you know which keywords to look for, he, uh, uh, David Yanofsky had this um, whole uh, Yanofsky, sorry, I mispronounced his name, um, has this whole tweet deck column that. Um, had a really big long search string to it and instead what we did is we put this into a little bot and we asked the bot to watch Twitter to see um, if these things could come up and then every once in a while we get a, an alert in Slack it looks like this and it says detecting six related glitch related tweets so far today here's the latest and it's it's the latest tweet from a group that uh, might be, it might be a sign that he needs to do some extra reporting. So these are not things, these are not bots that are designed to uh, replace journalists. Uh, there's some, a lot of discussion about that, um, especially in the financial journalism world, where uh, not so much the replacing journalists part, but uh, bots that, do, that write stories. We're more interested in making tools for journalists to uh, be able to keep track of their sources, keep track of their topics, and do their jobs better. So something like this, um, Yana would get a, a, a Slack message like this and could go investigate it further, maybe reach out to some of the people who were tweeting or reach out to the airlines. Um, if you're interested in what we're doing in this area, um, feel free to um, e send me an email, send it's a little group of us an email at bots at qz.com we'll add you to a list of people that we'll send notes to whenever we post blog, um, blog posts or uh, do anything on um, GitHub, if there's code. And in, we hope, September, when we release a whole bunch of tools in Slack, we'll also let folks know there. So bots at qz.com. And if you need to get a hold of me, there's me. And I think we're going to take some questions, right? Yeah. Thanks, John. Uh, that was really interesting. I'm just curious because I've been signed up for a couple of bots and it feels like some bots literally it's a blogger and I get one email that says, hey, I just have a new post and I get another thing through Facebook. Hey, I have a new post. So it's kind of like, okay, who would you say is really like cutting edge, really interesting to follow to see what's 
the best out there. Yeah, um, so it's early for, um, in our little project to find the best bots, and so I don't want to say any endorsements just okay. yet. Um, uh, but we do want to pull together examples of really good bots. I mean, Poncho is something which I mentioned, have, they've been working really hard at making that an ex a good experience. Um, so there is that, but um, many of them, there are some good bots that are very specific to certain industries, like uh, booking a flight or finding a rental car or things like that, right? Um, harder to do is this sort of news and information kind of experience, and so that's what we're really playing with. Um, so I think, and I've actually asked other people this exact question, and my, my read on the answers I've been getting are, is very similar to you. In fact, I would ask anybody here, if you have a bot you love, we, we should hear about it, because this has been a little bit of the experience. Um, that especially in the news industry, that the bots are not like not holding you, um, not holding your attention, or get, having you come back um, a, a great deal. Now, a couple of uh, the New York Times did a couple of really cool bots. Right, they had one around the election and politics. It was a messenger bot where it was just basically providing you some of the latest news in that format. That's very common. CNN does that too the latest sort of information in the chat format, not dissimilar from what we're doing. Um, and um, also they did, did anybody play with their Olympic spot, the New York Times Olympic spot, which they all call the Olympic spot, but actually was the reporter in, at, at the Olympics oh. in Rio, uh, reply, replying to a bunch of uh, uh, text messages. Yeah, it was really, really interesting. It was not automated at all. Uh, and they tried to answer as many as they could. Uh, they got a small, they got answered only a small fraction of them, but that was the, so that, that blogger experience. Is, is yeah. there a place to go and sort of see a list of these different? You'd think, right? Okay. No. So this is the discoverability problem. Okay. Um, Facebook is saying that they're going to um, be providing sort of a way to explore bots a little bit easier um, and feature them, not unlike the App Store or something like that, where you could browse or search or see featured ones, really good ones. So we're interested in that. We'd love to be a part of that. So we're going to look into that. Um, but yeah, there's not really. Uh, I have a list of Twitter bots. Uh, so Twitter bots can be really fun. Um, uh, on my on my site, actually, on my Twitter page, I have a list that's just bots, and these are automatic automated things that do things like post pictures or write poetry, and they're all automated. Um, we have one. One of my favorites is one called Marvin Prime. Marvin Prime is a quartz Twitter bot that tweets as if it were kind of a cantankerous tech reporter. Uh, and it, it, Marvin is pretty funny. You should check it up. Check it out. So, there are more questions over here. Hang, hang. Wait. Oops. Wait for. Okay, you got one here, and then over here. Go. Me go. Okay. Uh, yeah, I actually tried the Olympics one, and they didn't reply for two days, and then they were like, oh, sorry, we just have too many. And that was my response. One but, guy. Yeah. Um, my question is actually a little bit more boring and logistical, but I'm actually a UX UI writer, and um, I'm just starting to get into writing for bots, but just wondering how, you know, um, a lot of times when I'm writing, like, for digital products that um, it's, it comes even more complicated with chatbots, but how does the copy delivery, how does copy work with dev and design, and you know, is it just one large Excel sheet, and how does how does that work at Quartz? So at Quartz, a uh, couple of things that are interesting about the way uh, Quartz works. Um, so the uh, the app, the chat app that you saw, that is written by a bunch of people, um, and they all work in a common Google Doc. It's not a spreadsheet; it's a Google Doc. And then um, one person actually puts the the, the writing when it's edited and ready to go into a CMS that was built particularly for this system. Um, it, and it um, 
turns, puts it into a computer format that the bot then just gets whenever it needs it, um, or the app does. So that's how that happens. We had to make a custom CMS for it. The original plan, this is about a year ago, um, the original plan was to like take some of the information that is in the Quartz Daily Brief, which is a morning email, and have it automatically feed into this. It turned out that that doesn't work very well. You actually have to write it for this format. Um, so that's how it's, that, that's how it's done. Um, the writers, yeah, the, the writers were, were, the posting to the app, sorry, happens in the CMS, but the collaboration happens in a, in a shared Google Doc. Um, and we actually just hired, uh, I don't know how many of these there may be in the, in the country or the world, but we hired a bot editor. Uh, so we have somebody who's writing and editing just for our bot efforts as part of the bot studio. Um, Emily Withrow, and she's really great. Yeah, so here, can we, oh, you got it. Okay, you mentioned in the uh, WNYC project that you wanted to keep the voice of the radio host. Uh, can you give us a little more detail in terms of what that exactly meant in terms of phrasing, content, you know, whatever else? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. We worked really, really hard. So this is a week-long project. There were probably, um, we texted people at, at least once a day and sometimes three times a day for, an, uh, for a project about information overload, which we fully uh, admitted was a little bit funny that we were adding to your information. But, um, and um, Ariana Tubin and Manoush and I worked really hard to write each each text to be, so the other challenge with this is not unlike writing for Twitter or something like this, um, because of the system we were using and because we were sending these around the world, um, the thing that you can do a lot of times in your own phones where you can write more than 170 um, characters and it'll just put them together, we couldn't count on that to work. So all of this hap had to happen within 170 characters. So we were writing in Manusha's voice, which the producers and the writers for the show do all the time, right? They help her with the script, they know her voice, they're working in an editorial product. But then we had to get a point across in the spirit of her voice and, um, and you just accomplish whatever the text was supposed to accomplish. So it was hard and it was probably, um, I mean, for, we had a lot of different elements to that project, but it was one of the hardest things. We went around and around with that. Um, and then again, a shared Google Doc and then those um, phrases were put into the code to be sent out to people. Yeah, it's, it's but we took the time. And I think that's the key part. We had to really take the time. Um, so one, the camera can't. Oh, okay, fine, fair enough, now it works. So I had a question around um, demographic usage of the app. I mean, I have it on my phone, I love it, but I don't know what typical age group is that you're going after through this actual application versus your site. And then I had another question around, so you preset the inputs that the user has because of the buttons that are there. But one of the major challenges around bot design is contextualization. And most of the bots that are out there right now are really more advanced decision trees than actual conversational interfaces. Right. Um, so I, I, I guess I'd like to ask kind of what you're thinking about have, what, what you're going to do with that white space on Facebook, yeah. because that's where the real contextualization could come in if someone yeah. asked for further questions about the article. Yeah. That, I mean, that's... So a couple of questions. On the demographics, um, I'm going to punt on that a little bit, um, because partly because I'm new and partly because I think basically we're looking, I can say that um, we are looking to get, to extend the Quartz brand, to go to places where people are, right? That's what we're all trying to do. Um, and so um, the focus has mainly been that demographic crossed with iPhone users. That was really the, the, the goal. Um, we launched uh, an Android version in December, but didn't promote it a whole lot, sort of like whiz bang, it's out there and it works and it's great. Um, but there's probably more opportunity there too. There's a lot of folks who use Android around the world that, and, and across the US who we could be tapping into. So it's a little, um, and, and 
just having come from many years in public radio, I knew that that demographic stuff in the back of my head all the time, but I don't have that at the top of mind for, for, for courts, I'm sorry. Um, um, and your other question was about the contextualization. the contextualization, right? It's So I don't know what we're gonna do with that white box. What I will say is that when they were first developing the app, right, um, the idea was that you could do uh, sort of a choose your own adventure. Uh, it's actually built that way, the, the back end code is actually set up so right now we have those two buttons you pick, right? One is basically more and one is skip, basically. Um, and that after some, some um, trial runs, that turned out to be the most sort of comfortable and useful, uh, useful way for the user, really. Um, you do end up with a whole complication about creating more paths because then you have to write them, right? And exactly your point, you know, where is that going to take you? Is it where that the writer or where the user wants to go? We're even interested in like, so when you get to the bot, when you get to the bottom of a little screen, you can basically say, uh, "Tell me more" or "Skip." But we play with the tell me more thing, and we're like, oh, really? What else happened? Or like, and we sort of put words in your mouth, and we're finding that emoji are really great for that because you could just put in like an ex a surprised emoji, and that that counts as like more, right? So that we get a little get away with it a little bit with emoji. But as soon as people start um, writing to us in that space, we're not sure what's going to happen. Um, and in reality, are we going to be able to, to provide, like if somebody said, wait, uh, you know, tell me more about Pythagoras. <laughs> it's sort of like, eh, I don't, we don't have that, we didn't write that. <laughs> so um, I, it's, hard, it's hard to know exactly. I think that's part of what we're going to be experimenting with. Yeah. So, I'm Mike, I think, yeah. So my question was about uh, experimentation, especially usability. Yeah. There are a couple of bot examples because it's still such a new technology where they go horribly wrong. Uh, are there any challenges or experiments that you've tried that really didn't work uh, and that you found early with usability testing? Yeah, so I mean, this whole notion of choose your own adventure for the news app was something I did, didn't go horribly wrong, but it was clear that that wasn't the, the way um, that made sense. Um, um, there's also just kind of a pacing issue sometimes, like the can you just feel if you have to extract the information from the bot, you know, it's like, it really? I mean, I can just read an article. Like, I, I often people are like, talking about news bots and saying, oh, well, you could just write in the box, the white box, you know, well, what else did Donald Trump do today? And I would say, there's a white box that is very famous with a bunch of colored letters above it <laughs> that's really good at that. You Google that and you get that information, right? So I can't imagine that you would go seek out our bot to ask that question. So, so it's hard to know. I, I think in terms of the this is, it, it gets into some interesting territory because it turns out that what a lot of people will say in that box uh, will be very mean. It's very weird. People like to abuse robots, um, which is weird and um, swear at them and like to say horrible things. Um, well, actually, a writer for uh, Quartz, Leah Fessler, um, did this great story, um, I can tweet it out again, or you can search for it, um, where she sexually harassed several voice bots to see what happened. And what was weird, so why would you do that, right? Just for the entertainment? Her point was, for a lot of reasons, that's it, the reactions are kind of interesting because on some of them, the reaction was kind of like, ha ha. You know, it's like, really? It, what about, hey, buddy, that's not appropriate. And all of that gets coded, right? So then how do you handle, basically, so you're the, I'm getting to the answer to the question, your question, or at least the, uh, asking another question. How do you handle that? How, what's the appropriate response to abuse um, in a way that maybe makes a statement and says, hey, you know, that's not, that's not, not only is that just not cool or ha ha, shouldn't use your language that way, but like, no, this is wrong. So what's our responsibility as coders to in include that? I think that's where things get 
kind of interesting. And it's only because we know that some large chunk of the inputs will be that. Um, so I guess that's one of the biggest challenges. If that, I don't know if that answers your question. But it's, it's definitely like, OK, so we're going to talk about the information. We're going to talk about the fun jokes and stuff. And then we're going to talk about how we deal with all the crap we're going to get and worse. So there's some questions up here, too. Here. Now, I wanted to ask a question on a slightly different uh, non-technical approach, which is um, I'm convinced that bots and all this stuff is going to become far more sophisticated over the years. I'm wondering the thought behind what happens when we don't recognize whether we're talking, you know, the Turing thing. We don't know, are we dealing with a human, are we dealing with a machine? And, and we all know that we won't know. We just won't know. Right. So the question is, what responsibilities uh, are there and what do we, responsibilities do we have if we can't tell the difference visually as well as by text and any other me mechanism of communication? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's a great question. I think that um, I was chatting on a, on a panel recently about good bots versus bad bots. <laughs> and um, and I, I think that it's going to be across the board. I mean, what are, what's the responsibility? I mean, on one hand, you could say, what's the responsibility as a society not to um, pass along fake news, right? I mean, it's hard to answer those questions, right? Uh, and, and even when people say, well, what about this technology? It, you're right, that could mimic humans. That could be an issue. I think it's, it's already an issue in some cases. We have websites and other, other outlets mimicking journalism, which is problematic, problematic at least in my opinion. Um, and um, you know, even did anybody get the phishing email today? The right, the Google phishing email. So even via email, we still have horrible things that are coming our way. So I, I think that all of technology has the ability to be used for good and for evil, and I think that yeah, I mean, among the. Among the good actors, we have lots of responsibility. I'm not convinced that you're going to see that as a universal principle. Okay, let's take one more question. Okay, well, follow up to this. It's just the question then really is when uh, our society recognizes that we don't know the difference, what's society's response to all that? That's, yeah. the, that's the second part of it. Yeah. I can't wait to find out. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have the answer for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay, one more one question more. and yeah. then we'll wrap up. All right, OK. Is that where you're going? Yeah. OK. Um, I love the news app and how it's different from all the news apps out there. Just downloaded it. Oh, good. And um, I'm curious about how this new format opens up new possibilities for how you measure customer engagement. Like, what are metrics you use when your product is a bot? And how, how does that get, get you a different perspective on understanding your customers? Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, the, the things I've seen mostly, so a lot of these bots are extending brands, right? So it'll be a chat bot for your favorite toy or something like that. And it's about developing a relationship with a brand and maybe not necessarily providing the latest news and information. So in our bot of sorts, our app, uh, you actually get to the end. There's a, there's a place where it says, that's all we got for you now. And we intentionally sort of say, that's it. Right? But for a lot of um, bots, the metrics are things like how long are people engaging with it? Um, also, how much valid information are they getting? Are they getting what they came for? That's a big thing. Um, there's also a big sort of question of how often uh, you're in the middle of a conversation and you just drop off, right? So very similar, I think, and this is not my field, but in the area of online commerce, right? People go through and then they don't buy, right? And why, why are they dropping off? What, and I, in, because it's so early and the bots are not awesome yet, um, I think that a lot of it is just like people getting frustrated. It doesn't understand you, you're not phrasing something correctly, um, and you just like, give up, right? So the give up rate, I think, is really important. So those are some of the early metrics that I know of, um, at least, and our, in our organization, we're just trying to see if the user experience can be 
up to the standards that we hope to convey. Um, it's one of the cool things I'll just say about Quartz that I felt even before I started working there is that from the email to the website to the app, the user experience is always number one. It's like really, they really work hard at that. Um, and if you can't make a bot that meets that standard and makes you feel like not only did you get information that was accurate, but you also felt good about it, yeah, it was a sort of a joyful experience, and it's not. That's going to be our metric. It's like, eh, no, can't do that. Thank you, everybody. That was a lot of fun. Thank you, John. That was yeah. a really fascinating, fun talk. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you again to our sponsor, Workbench, a uh, BC firm investing in enterprise technology. And also thank you very much to Zoom Data, uh, which deals with big data and without whom we wouldn't have had all the pizza and water back there. Um, thank you everyone for coming and uh, we'll see you next month.